Hello, this is Israel in the Church, part five. Anti-Semitism and the Church, and also the Shoah. Now, this talk will be a little bit different to the other ones, because I am going to give a brief overview of some of the facts of history concerning this topic. And I think that is important. I hope enough uh, facts are given to speak to our heart. These, these are details that are tragic and so often ignored. Now, we did look in part four at the continuing spread of anti-Semitism and Jew hatred throughout history. And we looked particularly at some biblical examples. So, first of all, one of the reasons that Jews were persecuted by church groups and by Christian communities was the accusation that they were Christ killers. As we will hear, this was a used as an excuse for evil hatred and all manners of horrors against Jewish people over centuries. So I'm just going to look at this issue first. Who was responsible for the death of the Lord Jesus? Well, let's start in uh, the preaching of Peter on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, 22 to 23. Men of Israel, he preaches, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Now, he's addressing there men of Israel, particularly Jewish religious leaders at the time. Now, soon after this, uh, Peter and John were hauled before the religious council, aggressively questioned about the healing of the lame beggar at the beautiful gate of the temple. And this is how Peter answered to the high priest, elders and scribes who were before him. This is Acts 4.10. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well, in other words, healed. So religious leaders were responsible, as were the crowd persuaded by the priests and elders, who'd been given the choice by Pilate to have released either Jesus or the notorious prisoner Barabbas, and they chose the latter. The governor Pilate then said the following, in Matthew 27, 21 to 26, to the crowd before him, with the religious leaders amongst them. Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them then, what shall I do with Jesus, who's called the Christ or the Messiah? They all said, let him be crucified. As we know, a horrific form of death. And he said, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. So Pilate, when he saw he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water, he washed his hands before the crowd, and he said, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. By the way, he wasn't innocent. God had actually, just before this, given him a warning. Because this conversation is recorded in verse 19. It says, besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that righteous man. For I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. So his wife is trying to warn him off, killing the Lord Jesus. Nevertheless, says the people answered, his blood be on us and on our children. Now, it is actually though a wicked lie to say that because there was a responsibility on these Jews at that time, the Jews everywhere throughout time bear the guilt of this decision and are therefore to be persecuted. The passage goes on, he released for them Barabbas, having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Now, this was carried out by Gentile Roman soldiers of the Roman forces. 
So here we have Gentiles being involved. Also, also responsible. This is Acts 4, 27 to 28. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod, that's Herod Antipas, by the way. Um, his father was Herod the Great, so-called. And uh, his father, Herod the Great, was an Edomite, and his mother was a Samaritan. So Herod Antipas is Gentile. And Pontius Pilate, Roman, of course, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. So, so we see Gentiles totally involved in this, wanting Jesus crucified and carrying it out along with Jews. They were not puppets, by the way, although the Lord knew this was going to happen and predestined Jesus as the Lamb of God. The Father and Jesus both uh, were determined that this would happen to fulfill the scriptures and to produce forgiveness of sins for those who would believe in the Lord Jesus. Those involved, those were not puppets, they chose. Nevertheless, they were fulfilling God's plan. So who was ultimately responsible then for the death of Jesus? Well, let's go back to the famous passage in the Old Testament, Isaiah 53. And let's just pick up verse 10. It says, it was the will of the Lord, it's talking about the Father there, to crush him, it's talking about the Lord Jesus the Son of God, the eternal Son of God. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. He is put into grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. So the father had determined by his will that this would happen. What about Jesus? Well, John 17 to 18 says, and this is very significant, for this reason, the Father loves me, says Jesus, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. And notice what he says then. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I've received from my Father. So Jesus had this willingness, total willingness, to be sacrificed as the Lamb of God for our sins. Yes, nearly all the Jewish religious leaders, and many in Jerusalem at that time, were involved in responsibility for killing Jesus, along with many Gentiles, the Roman forces, Pilate's decision. But we need to remember, Jesus laid down his life, and it was the Father's will because of our sins. So, this makes what happened in terms of the accusation of Christ killers towards the Jews in the church all the more puzzling and evil. So by the beginning of the third century, church teaching, for instance, exemplified by the leading third century theologian Hippolytus of Rome, was casting the Jews as solely responsible for the death of Jesus, the Christ killers. And this charge would echo throughout church history with tragic effects. Hippolytus taught that as killers of Jesus, the Jews were eternally cut off. And subsequently, down through history, many thousands of Jews have been murdered as Christ killers. Now, the influence of replacement theology in teaching that Israel had permanently forfeited any covenantal blessings and the church has replaced Israel in God's purposes, led many church leaders, such as Oregon, to be intense in their condemnation of the Jews. This also meant that the church would inevitably abandon many of its Jewish roots. Let's look at a few examples of this. So Oregon himself, around about AD 20, said the following, he was an influential Christian philosopher and teacher, he used much allegorical interpretation. He said, the Jews were a most wicked nation, which although guilty of many other sins, yet has been punished so severely as for none, as for those committed against our Jesus. In other words, that's their ultimate crime. It's the ongoing charge of Christ killers. Ambrose, who was appointed Bishop of Milan in AD 374, known as the Bishop with the Golden Tongue, said the following, the Jews are odious assassins of Christ and for killing God, there's no expiation possible, no indulgence or pardon. Now listen to this, Christians may never cease vengeance and the Jew must live in servitude forever. God always hated the Jews. What a lie. 
And he adds, it's essential that all Christians hate them. And you can see how this is embedding. <clears throat> now, in the early first, uh, fourth century, the Roman emperor uh, was Constantine the I. Now, most Roman emperors fiercely persecuted Christians, for instance, Nero Diocletian. However, this began to change with a supposed conversion to Christianity of Constantine around AD 312. And the church began to merge with the state. By the way, this is not good news. Constantine had put the cross on Roman soldiers' shields and the church was fast becoming inextricably linked to the Roman state and its military campaigns. Constantine forbade Jews to live in Jerusalem. He did call the Council of Nicaea in 325 and it did write the admirable Nicene Creed, which for instance defended the doctrine of the Trinity, admirable in most areas. It also defended the eternal divinity of Jesus, but it also condemned, and this is not so admirable, belief in the millennial reign of Jesus as heresy, and Easter was separated from Passover. And Sunday was now declared the day of rest, not the original Sabbath, Friday uh, dusk to Saturday dusk. And the church continued to abandon its Jewish roots. And in 380 AD, the Emperor Theodosius would make Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. There's more. I'm just giving a few examples here. Chrysostom, Bishop of Constantinople, lived from about 347 to 407, nicknamed Golden Mouth because of his eloquence. But he said the following about the Jews. They are inveterate murderers, destroyers, men possessed of the devil. He taught that God so hated the Jews that Christians are, quote, to hate them and long for their blood. And then St. Augustine, who many regard as the most influential theologian throughout the whole of church history, lived from about 354 to 430. And this is what he said about the Jews. The Jews wander over the entire earth, their backs bent over, their eyes cast downward, forever calling to our minds the curse they carry with them. Judas, that's Judas Iscariot. Judas is the image of the Jewish people. And here it is. They bear the guilt for the death of the Saviour, for through their fathers they have killed the Christ, ignoring, of course, the Gentiles' role in this too. Along with the view that the Jews were rejected and the church was now Israel, the spread of hatred and its results would now accelerate against the Jews now that the state and church were increasingly in tandem. From here on in, the church and the so-called Christian nations of Europe went full on in their Jew hatred. Whole books exist on this, but I'm just going to give a few examples. The Roman Emperor Justinian in the 5th century not only decreed that Jews were forbidden from meeting together, but they were also banned from building synagogues and reading the Bible in Hebrew. So in Europe, at the behest of popes, bishops, church councils, Christian emperors, there followed persecution outbreaks, kidnapping of Jewish children so they could be raised by Christians. This was in Spain. Forced baptisms and forced conversions. The seizure of property, the banning of Jews from many occupations, enslavement, and then wholesale massacres. For instance, in the late 19th century, we know of the pogroms that took place in Russia and many parts of Eastern Europe. Now, what about the Crusades, where the Roman Catholic Church sent out forces to liberate Jerusalem from Muslim rule? Well, just let me give you a couple of facts. The leader of the First Crusade in 1096 was called Godfrey de Bouillon. And he said that he was going to avenge the blood of Christ on Israel and leave no member of Jewish, the Jewish race alive. So those involved in the first crusade destroyed whole Jewish communities along the Rhine and Danube on their way towards Israel. Um, 
That was men, women and children. And when Jerusalem was taken in July 1099, they herded the Jews into a synagogue, locked them in and burnt them alive whilst they chanted, Christ, we adore you. The Fourth Lateran Council of the Church, led at the time the church by Pope Innocent III, this was in 1215, copied an earlier Muslim practice. This decreed that the Jews wear a badge or distinctive clothing to mark them off from Christians. So, in, for instance, in parts of 13th century France in the Middle Ages, it was a yellow or white oval badge. Yellow badge, we'll come back to that because, of course, the Nazis adopted this practice. And it was a practice started by Muslims but adopted by Christian communities. In England, the Jews were robbed and Edward I actually had them expelled in 1290. They weren't allowed back until Cromwell's reign in 1655. There was tragic loss of life in a number of Jewish communities. Many cities included, such as London, Norwich, and my home city of York. Now, a particularly nasty lie that over the centuries led to the murder of thousands of Jews in many countries, including England, was what was called the blood libel. This was a wicked accusation that Jews kidnapped Christian children, murdered them, and then used their blood in the making of Passover bread. To give you an example, in the 13th century Munich, an entire Jewish community of 180 individuals was killed because of that accusation. In the mid-14th century, thousands of Jews were blamed for the Black Death. It was their fault, some sort of cursing or witchcraft. And they were murdered across Germany and France by Christian communities. Of course, it wasn't witchcraft. Many of the Jews followed the Levitical laws concerning the plague and handling of the dead bodies, and therefore were less vulnerable to the plague's ravages. But it didn't help them. From the late 15th century onwards, for three centuries, we had the Spanish Inquisition, forced conversion to Catholicism or exile. And uh, those who wouldn't convert were often cruelly tortured or killed in their thousands. In the 16th century, the first ghetto was established in Venice. And this would be repeated across Europe in many places. The Jews only been permitted to live in very restricted areas under appalling conditions. Now you might say, well, okay, but the, these people were not real Christians. And in some cases, you may well be right. But let's look at some other very disturbing examples. Now, Martin Luther, of course, is to be honored for the role he played in uh, abandoning the superstitions of the Catholic Church and in propagating the truth that salvation was by grace and not works. That was a great thing but I don't believe he should be honoured for some of the things that followed later in his ministry. Because although he initially reached out the Jews, to the Jews hoping they would convert, when they didn't, he turned viciously against them. I'll just give you uh, a couple of examples of what he said. There are actually many. In the 1543 book on the Jews and their lies, he asked the question, what shall we do with this rejected and condemned people, the Jews. So in this small book pamphlet, he said the following. Here are his recommendations. Martin Luther, the great reformer, set fire to their synagogues or schools, their houses also to be razed and destroyed, their rabbis be forbidden to teach henceforth on pain of loss of life and limb. Safe conduct on the highways be abolished completely for the Jews. Let them be driven like mad dogs out of the land, throw brimstone and pitch upon them. If one could throw hell fire at them, so much the better. Next to the devil, he says, a Christian has no more bitter and galling foe than the Jews. And then he adds, we're at fault in not slaying them. Now that is pretty horrific, but it had results. Luther was involved, for instance, in the expulsion of the Jews from Saxony in 1537. He called them a plague and a pestilence, said next to the devil the Christian has no more bitter and galling foe than a Jew. He went out of his way to reduce physical, induce physical revulsion of the Jews with foul and repulsive words that I actually 
I'm not willing to say here uh, for this recording. Luther's 1546 sermon, Admonition Against the Jews, contains accusations against the Jews of ritual murder, black magic, poisoning of wells. And in his last sermon delivered at Eisleben, his place of birth, only three days before his death, Luther called for the expulsion of Jews from all German territory. This aspect of Martin Luther's teaching and practice seems to me persistently largely glossed over or often ignored by the modern evangelical church. Now, what about John Calvin, the revered theologian by many of the Reformation? Well, there were no Jews in Geneva at Calvin's time. Nevertheless, he wrote the following in 1560. No mercy here. Their rotten and unbending stiff-neckedness deserves that they be oppressed unendingly and without measure or end, and that they die in their misery without the pity of anyone. Now these are Luther and Calvin, the great reformers admired by so many. Were the Eastern churches any better, the, the Orthodox churches, the Russian Orthodox churches? Well, no, they, they weren't. For instance, we know that uh, in Russia, the Jews were persecuted for centuries by the church in league with the Tsars like Ivan the Terrible. And the word pogrom brings shudder still today, shuddering to many Jews for good reason. There were pockets of love for the Jews among some churches. For instance, the Moravians, the Puritans and the Plymouth Brethren led the way in this. But the predominant history of the church's involvement in the hatred and persecution of Jews is sadly appalling. Jeremiah said this of the attitude of the surrounding nations concerning the Jews as he witnessed them being exiled by the Babylonians. I'm taking this scripture from Jeremiah 50 verses 6 to 7. My people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have led them astray, turning them away on the mountains. From mountain to hill they've gone. They've forgotten their fold. Then notice what it says here in verse 7. Then all who found them have devoured them, and their enemies have said, we're not guilty, for they have sinned against the Lord, their habitation of righteousness, the Lord, the hope of their fathers. Now, of course, there was fierce Islamic persecution too, since the time of Muhammad, and that continues today, but time prevents me from going into that. Now, I think it's important that every Christian understands something about the Shoah, as the Hebrews call it, or the Holocaust. And I'm going to give a few issues here because we are supposed to learn from history. And this is a most horrific episode in history, the culmination of years of hatred of the Jews. Now, sadly, Luther's 1543 pamphlet on the Jews and their lies became something of a blueprint for Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, which was overnight 9th to 10th of November 1938 where effectively the Nazis were testing out how the people would respond to their hatred of the Jews. And it's tragic how they did respond or ignore it. A night that brought riots, lootings, beatings, widespread destruction of synagogues and Jewish properties and Jewish cemeteries were desecrated. This is Kristallnacht. Shortly after Kristallnacht, the bishop in the Evangelical Lutheran Church, Martin Sass, he applauded the burning of the synagogues. They were still burning overnight on the 10th of November. And he said of that date, in rejoicing, this is a bishop, on November the 10th, on Luther's birthday, the synagogues are burning in Germany. The German people, he urged, ought to heed these words of the greatest anti-Semite of his time, the warner of his people against the Jews. Now Hitler, Himmler and Heydrich, in their evil final solution, as they called it, their ultimate policy to wipe out all the Jews of Europe, took advantage of this deeply embedded Jew hatred in Europe and German society. They clearly were not Christians. Himmler, for instance, was involved in occult practices. But they did take advantage of this prevailing hatred, including amongst many churches and Christian communities. One of the most virulent Nazis in hating the Jews during this time period was called Julius Streicher, he edited the Nazi propaganda newspaper, Der Sturmer. 
During his trial at Nuremberg, and he was executed for his crimes, many escapes, but he didn't, he claimed the following. This is a quote from Stryker. Dr. Martin Luther would very probably sit in my place in the defense dock today if this book had been taken into consideration by the prosecution. In the book, The Jews and Their Lies, Dr. Martin Luther writes that the Jews are a serpent's brood and, should burn, and we should burn, one should burn down their synagogues and destroy them. He was basically saying at his trial, hey, I'm just following Christian teaching. That's all I did. The Jews and their lies had been presented by the city of Nuremberg to Stryker as a birthday present in 1937. De Sturmer described it, this newspaper, as the most radically anti-Semitic tract ever published. And the Nazis actually displayed this work of Martin Luther in a glass case at their Nuremberg rallies. In Mein Kampf, in his praise of certain men, statesmen and reformers, it's no surprise that Hitler has stated, besides Frederick the Great, stands Martin Luther, as well as Richard Wagner. In other words, one of his three all-time heroes. So what are the Catholic Church? Let's give a couple of examples. In World War II, in Slovakia, 58,000 Jews were rounded up by the Slovakian Halinka forces. That was a guard cooperating with the German forces in concentration camps. And these Jews were deported to three of the German death camps. Of this 58,000 in Slovakia, barely 300 of these Jews survived the war. Now the country was led at the time by a Catholic priest, President Tiso, who at mass in 1942 said it had been a Christian act to expel the Jewish pests, and also said that it was impossible for Jews to be converted to Christianity, as a Jew remains a Jew, even if he's baptized by a hundred bishops. And he wasn't restrained by the Catholic hierarchy. And in 1943, we actually know that Jews were deported from Rome right under the nose of Pope Pius XII, and he said nothing. However, some nuns did, bless them, hide Jews. And mainly Catholic France, a supposedly very cultured nation, had thousands of children transported to the extermination camps on their own without their parents. So the Holocaust is a lesson, a warning for the future of the church. The, the word means whole burnt offering. Many Jews prefer the term Shoah, desolation or destruction, because it, it has no religious inference. The Holocaust was the genocide of around six million Jews out of seven to eight million Jews in German-occupied Europe, killed by Nazi Germany and their collaborators between around about 41 and 45, two thirds of all of Europe's Jews. Mass shootings initially carried out by death squads known as the Einsatzgruppen. They couldn't have carried out their mass shootings without the vicious cooperation of police and paramilitary groups and even ordinary citizens. We see this in many countries, Ukraine, Lithuania, Latvia, Romania, and Hungary, for instance. The Einsatzgruppen and their allies killed one and a half million Jews. It is thought that 33,771 Jewish men and women and children were killed naked, having been beaten by the Einsatzgruppen C group at a place called Babi Yar in Ukraine over two days 29th to 30th of September 1941, with the help of Ukrainian forces. 33,771 in two days shot. It's so hard to put across the, the heartbreak involved in all of this and, and the viciousness. Other Jews were starved in ghettos or died in appalling labor camps, but the majority were murdered in the six major death camps in occupied Poland. Their names shudder through history. Belzec, Chelmno, Majidek, Sobibor, Treblinka, and then Auschwitz-Birkenau. At the latter, 1.1 million Jews were murdered. So the terror of the Shoah is indescribable. And of course, it comprises individual tragedies and heartbreak of millions. It's easy to get lost in the huge numbing numbers involved. 
But I've come across many times individual photos online and in books that are deeply moving, can be overwhelming. Two examples, take the Jews of Lubny in the Ukraine. On October the 16th, 1941, the entire Jewish population of this little town, Lubny, there's about a thousand Jews, uh, were taken out of the town, men, women, and children. At the time, they didn't know what was gonna to happen to them, but they were killed on that very same day, men, women, and children, by German death squads with the enthusiastic help of local Ukrainians. That's October 16th, 41. The Germans had only occupied the town in, on September 13th. There's one of hundreds of such accidents across Europe. Then there's the appalling case of the Hungarian Jews. This was in 1944, in the summer. By this time, it was clear that the Germans were losing the war. They were going to lose it. And yet, in their hatred of the Jews, they diverted military resources and money from their armed forces, who were losing the war by this time, to further slaughter of the Jews. So in 1944, Adolf Eichmann, aided by the anti-Semitic Hungarian military forces, such as the Arrow Cross Group, oversaw in just two months, listen to this, two months, the transport on trains of 424,000 Hungarian Jews. The vast majority of them were killed on arrival. By the end of the Holocaust, 565,000 Hungarian Jews had been murdered. Just satanic hatred. What about Poland, where these death camps were? Of course, the Poles suffered, and how the Jews suffered. Poland has a long history, a tragic history, unfortunately, of anti-Semitism. But the German forces came in, 1939, start of the war under a pretext, and 3.3 uh, million Jews lived there. Poland was the center of the European Jewish community. Out of this 3.3 million, at the end of the war, only 380,000 Polish Jews remained alive. The rest had been murdered, mostly in the ghettos and death camps. By the way, just a year after the end of World War II, on the 4th of July, 1946, in Kielce, Poland, it is astonishing that 40 Jews were killed because of a false accusation of child kidnapping, the old blood libel. That's after the Holocaust, back in Poland. What an enduring hatred. Now, there were exceptions. Some of you will know of Raoul Wallenberg, the Swedish diplomat. These were a minority of exceptions, sadly. Others will have seen the film Schlindler's List about Oskar Schlindler, who rescued many Jews who worked in his industrial sites. Now, the church in most European countries failed, but the Bulgarian Orthodox Church with their King Boris actually saved most of their Jewish lives. The king paid the price, it seemed, because he was subsequently suspiciously poisoned, it's thought by the Nazis. Denmark managed to send most of their 7,500 Jews to the safety of neutral Switzerland. The Bishop of Copenhagen, Copenhagen, bless him, said it was the duty of the Christian church to protest against any such persecution. And the Swedes, to their credit, had broadcast they would welcome any such Jews. Britain, just before the outbreak of the war, had led in about 50,000 Jews, including 9,000 children on what are known as the kinder transports. Without their parents, most of them, the vast majority, would never see their parents again. Some of you will have seen the documentary on a man called Nicholas Winton, who organized the rescue of 664 of those children from German-occupied Czechoslovakia. They would have been murdered otherwise. And there were Christians like the Ten Boom family in the Netherlands, Dietrich Bonhoeffer in Germany, who opposed the Nazis bravely. Now, considering that the scriptures prophesy that anti-Semitism will persist and be intense before the coming of the Lord Jesus, the return of the Lord Jesus, uh, it's important, I think, that the church meditates on these things and does better in the future. Will the church imitate 
such brave minorities. Let me give one other example. What an inspiring one this, this is. 80%, tragically, of Greece's 70,000 Jews were murdered. But the Athens Archbishop, Damaskinos, protested to the Germans, called on clergy to hide Jews, and many did. The hundreds were arrested by the Nazis. Now on the island of Zakynthos, there were 275 Jews. And they survived the Holocaust. Why? Why? Well, it's because of the courageous actions of Bishop Chrysostomos and Mayor Lucas Carra. Their bravery is recognised by Yad Vashem in Israel, who recognised them as righteous among the nations. What happened? Well, in 1944, Mayor Lucas Carra was ordered at gunpoint by the Nazis to hand over a list of 275 Jews residing on the island. The list was subsequently presented to Germans by uh, Bishop Chrysostomos, and it had two names on it. The two names, rather than 275 Jews, were Mayor Carra and Bishop Chrysostomos. The bishop said to the Germans, here are your Jews. If you choose to deport the Jews of Sikinthos, you must also take me. I'll share their fate. All the Jews of the island had actually been safely hidden by the local population in mountainous villages. The whole island knew what was happening. Not one person revealed their whereabouts. And incredibly, all 275 Jews survived. So Hitler and the Nazis introduced their genocidal Jew hatred, ending in the Holocaust. But it followed a long history of anti-Semitism in Europe, including, as we've seen, in churches and Christian communities. The ground had been laid by church persecution of the Jews, built on theologies of scripture and declarations by church leaders that in many cases divested the Jews of their covenant promises and their ongoing corporate calling. And even going so far in some cases to say God had permanently rejected the Jews and was punished them. And helping God punish them was rendering him a service. Now, as we know, Islam had also persecuted Jews since the time of Muhammad. He was involved in betraying two Jewish tribes and had them slaughtered. But how tragic that a long history of anti-Semitic policies and actions took place in many churches and denominations and so-called Christian nations who owe so much Christians to the Jews. This should have been unthinkable. It's not surprising, therefore, that today many, many Messianic Jews will not use the name Christian to describe themselves to their fellow Jews because it's a stumbling block, because it comes back to the history of what the Christian church perpetrated on the Jews. They will still witness these Messianic Jews of their Messiah, Yeshua. Dr. Michael Brown, a great Bible teacher and scholar, a Messianic Bible teacher and scholar, quotes one rabbi's experience. Please listen closely to this. This is what a rabbi said, and this is just tragic. Growing up in an Orthodox Jewish household, I held great antipathy towards Jesus. The very name reminded me of the suffering Christians laid upon Jewish communities for 2,000 years. Persecutions, forced conversions, expulsions, inquisitions, false accusations, degradations, economic exile, taxation, pogroms, stereotyping, ghettoization, and systematic extermination. All this incomprehensible violence against us, against our friend and families committed in the name of a Jew. It's tragic. So I'm gonna conclude with a quote from the wonderful Anglican Archbishop J.C. Ryle, who said the following in a sermon in 1858. The sermon was called Scattered Israel to be regathered his belief in the prophetic future for the Jews. Here it is. It is a duty incumbent on all Gentile Christians to be specifically careful that they take up stumbling blocks out of the way of Israel, and two, that they do nothing to discuss them with Christianity or hinder their conversion. This is a matter which is expressly mentioned in Scripture. Therefore, we find Isaiah bidding us take up the stumbling blocks out of the way of God's people. That's Isaiah 57, 14. And then Ryle adds, truly the prophet might speak well of this. No man can look round the Gentile churches 
and fail to see that he had cause. Amen. <laughs>